types of actors were perfectly in sync. Almost, you know, with a Robert Altman film, I think you had the freedom to, to ad lib or to, or to play off each other. Tell me the first time you met Donald. The first time I met him was on the set of The Dirty Dozen. And he was in the bottom half of The Dirty Dozen. He was in the, 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 the ones that were not well known yet. Tell me the first time you met Donald and how you knew you had a kindred spirit. So. Well, uh, Donald was cast uh, first. And then uh, once uh, Bob cast me, <coughs> He asked if I would have lunch alone with Donald and the commissary of 20th Century Fox. So the two of us had lunch, and in the first moment, I had a feeling that we didn't like one another, but it all worked out. You know, the football game, it, it's visually, it is a game for its time. Straight ahead kicking, not soccer style kicking, the extra point, I'm an old kicker, that's why I noticed those things. That yellow tee. And the big number 88 was Ben Davidson, who played for the Giants and the Raiders, and Walter Roberts, the flea, was the little guy. And Fred Williamson, you can't call an African-American, obviously, a spear chucker anymore. And, and rightly so. The little guy was Nolan Smith, who played for the Smith, that's right, that's right, you're right. I stand correct together. I'll get it together. But Fred Williamson was in the first Super Bowl, bragging that he would not Back, and he got knocked out in the, in the, in the Super Bowl. And, he, and they made a lot of black exploitation, so called black exploitation films after that. How did he come to the project? Fred Williamson? Yeah. Uh, Ingo Permiter hired him. Yeah, he was the producer. I well, when you knew they were going to do a football game, were you, were you shocked to see professional guys there? Well, Jack Hen Cannon was the uh, quarterback. Uh, quarterback for the other side, and he played for, no, no, he played for the Chicago Bears. And then Tom Wodeschick was the last one smoking the reefer. He's an adorable guy. He plays for the Philadelphia Eagles, and I called him because I was a fan, you know. And, and I, I, I pretended that uh, I said, you, "You mind being naked if we shoot in the locker room?" And he, he laughed. He was game, but we didn't have to. Now those guys have to ease up on you a little bit. I saw you complete some nice passes there at quarterback. I mean, did, did, did you volunteer for that position? Was that part of the role? Well, that's how I was cast, but uh, I, you know, I, I could act. <laughs> One of the things, you know, I saw, this is the second time, I, I came in the last hour tonight because I saw two nights ago on Turner Classics. I've seen the film about 20 times over the years, and I never saw a film which speaks to the word quirkiness, and everybody's relaxed and in sync, and, and, and was that, a, work, uh, a function of you working with, with Robert Alton's style of directing or finding people who work like you? Because I've never seen that since in a movie. Well, no, to begin with, Donald and I, who were sort of segregated uh, when Bob introduced us to one another, uh, we hadn't worked that way. And we had a problem, uh, but it all worked out. We even complained to, to our agents uh, that uh, the way Bob seemed to be working. But uh, Bob reshot something and which uh, exhibited that he was willing to listen to our uh, uh, insecurity uh, and our uh, being somewhat uh, misguided in uh, how we work with him because it's all Robert Altman. When they, the, sh the picture was shown uh, to Ray Lardner Jr. Uh, at the studio, I never forget because that night uh, Lou Alcindor played against Will Chamberlain for the very first time and so I was listening to that on the radio. We were in the back lot at Dwayne Century Fox and I was showing Donald how to play against the wall, baseball against the wall with a small beam. You know what I'm talking about. New York game. And, uh, and then uh, uh, Ray Lardner came out and he walked up to me and he said, how could you do this to me? How could you do this to me? There's not a word that I wrote that's on screen. And Ray Lardner uh, Jr. went on to win the Academy Award that year for the screenplay. <laughs> Thanks to Robert Altman. Speaking of basketball and speaking of the Oscars, you were a presenter one year, and those days the Oscars were in March, during March Madness. And you got to give an, an award and you said the winner is? Indiana 86, Michigan 68. 
Um, I mean, it's sort of completely broke uh, the whole mold, but uh, it, 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 it was quite fine. And, and what did Bobby Knight do? Bobby Knight uh, said to me after he asked for me to be his uh, ABC special correspondent uh, for uh, the year that Bobby Knight was the American uh, Olympic Games coach, and Bobby said, if you want a, a Hollywood person, get Elliot. And so they got me. And Bobby said, other than winning the game itself, what, what you did was the best thing for people in middle America because it, it's about life, you know, and it's about what's happening then. He, and as wonderful as the Academy Awards is, it still is a popularity contest. And Bobby Knight is such a nice guy. Um, anyway, <laughs> you mentioned the word agent. Is that was sarcastic of you. <laughs> it really was well, sarcastic. I don't appreciate it. He didn't throw a chair at you, though, did he? No. Uh, no, 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 no. You mentioned the word agent. Is that story true that he once, on the phone, impersonated an agent and, and it, wound up, it wound up you getting a role? Well, in, in Rumble? No, no, I, I, I did impersonate an agent. Uh, when I was trying to get into my first Broadway musical in the chorus, and I, I called the producers to say that I was uh, Lester Scher, and called the producers and uh, said, look out for this kid, this school kid. He's very new, but he's talented. And, uh, and I didn't blow it, because that was dangerous, but I got into the show. You have played several characters who were played by other actors before you and after you. The famous is Trapper John, of course, but also Philip Marlowe, and Bogey, and Mitchum, and Dick Howell. Well, you were going to do Philip on the first one that you said. What? Trapper John? Oh, no, Trapper John. I, I'm the first one to play Trapper John. I know that, but other actors played this oh. after you played him. I, I, I remember mentioning it to Alan Holt because Alan had done Catch 22, which was supposed to be the picture of the time. Yeah, oh, and then Alan was, I bumped into him at uh, the Dan Polo Lounge uh, at the Earl Hills Hotel having breakfast. And he was uh, preparing to do a picture called The Moonshine Wars, which was sort of like a, you know, not a top picture, but Alan is a top uh, actor and artist. And I said to Alan, don't be depressed, Alan. Look what we did with MASH, and if we could do it, you know you're better than me, Alan, and you'll do fine. And of course, he went on to make all the money with the television show. <laughs> uh, yeah, but but Philip Marlowe, uh, Bogey, Mitchum, and, and Powell played Philip Marlowe before you. Did you make it a point not to see any of their performances over again before you took on the role? Over again? No, no, no. Uh, how I got to do The Long Goodbye was, uh, I, I went to see David Pinter at United Artists. At that point, I could not get a job. And this was after MASH and after the cover of Time and all of that. And at that point, uh, we thought Peter Bogdanovich, the wonderful Peter Bogdanovich uh, from the last picture show, was going to be directing the long goodbye. And, and David Pinter gave me the script and then said that uh, Bogdanovich uh, didn't see me in it. Uh, and couldn't see me in it. And then uh, uh, Bob Altman called me from Ireland because it was given to him, and Bob said to me, oh, what do you think? And I said, well, I always wanted to play this guy, Phil Marlow. And Bob Altman said, you are this guy. And that was the beginning of the picture. You mentioned in passing the cover of Time. That's quite an achievement. When Jay Leno made the cover of Time, he called his mother back in Massachusetts because he didn't understand that the magazine was sold in places besides Massachusetts. When you were called a star for an uptight age, when they told you to be on the cover of Time, that's pretty impressive. How did, how did you deal with that? If you had to deal with that. If you, when Bogey got his Oscar, he said a lot of big-headed people to tell me not to get big-headed. How would you manage not to get big-headed about that? Who said I couldn't get big-headed? <laughs> As you know, there were a couple of years after that, because uh, it was September 9th, 1970. Did you want to buy back copies of it? And the, uh, there were two, two different covers on the same date of the same magazine. The cover in the United States was a painting uh, of me as the character I played in the next picture after MASH, which was getting straight. The cover in Canada and Europe was a photograph of me as Trapper John 
in that Hawaiian shirt with my sunglasses, and it says, oh, just me, and you know, I'm really, uh, I mean, it, this has to go beyond pride in relation to my belief that we, each of us represents, each of us and all of us, uh, to the man from MASH. Uh, how did I deal with it? Um, I left the country immediately, I went to Sweden. You know, that I, until I started getting my notes about you together, I forgot. I was in an Elliot Gould movie. It played about half, half a day. It was called The Feminine Touch. Oh, you may as near. Does anyone speak Yiddish here? Yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I played a George Siegel. I was actually a George Siegel. Right. I was Conrad Janis. Well, you're right. Yes, yeah. and, and it really wasn't very successful. And I played a TV announcer or something, and I got about $20 for it. Maybe got more than that. No, not for that. I bet you did. No. But, but I was at the French Kent. My dad, dad was in the movie playing himself called Daisy Kent, <laughs> who Otto Kremers was directing, and, and Henry Fonda, and, and Joan Crawford. And, and playing himself, the critics said he was unconvincing. So, <laughs> well, well, but with, so the uh, man with the feminine touch, uh, that was still a union picture, and you're a member of the union, so I think you're exaggerating. Oh, I'm just beginning I would look into that. I have to make sure you don't exaggerate. Where in the Catskills did you work? Uh, uh, which hotel in the Catskills? The first hotel, uh, we first went to a place, do you know what a Koch Lane is? It's where you go and you cook for yourself. So we were at the Koch Lane, which we didn't have. It's where all the Jewish uh, uh, resorts were in the Catskills. But then there was a place called the Luxor Manor. And then there was uh, the Evans and Lock Sheldrick. But we filmed some of uh, a film that I had done, which was actually the first film that uh, I produced. Little Murders was done at the Concord. Oh, the other place. Yeah. I, I grew up on a gross and the Concord was always the other place. You are the only Jewish actor who ever boxed a kangaroo. With Boga uh, really? In Matilda. What was that like? I remember it. I remember reviewing it. And I said, boy, I don't want to be in issues for those people. <sighs> well, we, we, it was uh, actually uh, Al Ruddy who uh, produced The Godfather. Uh, produced uh, Matilda, and Matilda was based on a book. And you have to remember who wrote it. Uh, it'll, it'll come to me. Uh, but uh, there is, it was about a boxing kangaroo, and uh, we went to. No, no, that was kind of like wrong. Uh, not wrong. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter, but it wasn't a roll doll. But uh, th there was a, 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 an actor in a kangaroo suit, and the only time I ever uh, boxed with it was at the A at the, uh, the where they had animals, and uh, they had a real red kangaroo who kicked, kicked, and boxed, and you had to be careful. The kangaroo was ahead of his time, I guess. There was no mixed martial arts then. Uh, I know you hosted Saturday Night Live six times, but I didn't realize that, correct me if I'm wrong, you also made an unbilled appearance on the first episode as a juror when George Carlin was hosting. No. Well, well you listed as that. Really? Yes. Oh, well, I, I, I believe that, but I still want to check back. You're making 20 bucks. <laughs> you all, the last time you hosted was the first season of the new regime of Saturday Night Live, which was ill-fated. Did you I'm not sure that that was the last time yeah. that I hosted. I'm, I'm not so sure, but we can check that out because I also did a seventh show, no, which was hosted, I know what you're saying, by Tom Hanks, and that's when we established the five timer club. Yeah, with Steve Martin and, yeah, and, and Alec Baldwin, but when you. Alec Baldwin wasn't on that. Yeah, he was. He wasn't on in that show. <laughs> it's okay. All right. When you. When you. When you Work with a brand new, and I have regards to you from Joe Piscopo. You, you gave that to me already. Yeah, yeah. But Joe Piscopo did something really funny. We could do an act. Joe Piscopo sang to that uh, uh, Michael Jackson song. Uh, do you remember he did a video about uh, uh, in the graveyard? I, almost, I thought I would die. It was so funny. But did you notice a different, a whole different approach, a whole different mood, all different people, different producers? No, it was still uh, the same format. I, I wonder if we had uh, Dave Wilson uh, uh, was the same uh, director uh, who, who had done, done the shows, but uh, no, it wasn't uh, quite the same. 
but uh, Jean Dominion took it over from uh, Lauren Michaels, who was very much responsible for the show and still is. I think you're the only actor I know who has played the voice of God in two different projects, <laughs> in the Ten Commandments and in Moses. And not Moses, uh, the Ten Commandments and Noah. Was there a difference to, in, in the way you did the voice of God? No, uh, they, they were uh, two uh, animated films, and uh, Frankie Ablons, uh, who was uh, running Paramount when The Godfather was made, uh, produced, and he uh, uh, hired me to uh, play the voice of God. You were my son's hero in 1986, when he was about three years old. Oh, he was five years old then, because you were Casey, at Casey in the Valley. Oh, my. Yeah. That's when he first met you. You were, you were at the American Witch Colorado was together. And I said, then, this is the voice of Casey. It was a children's cartoon. It was more than the voice. It was Casey. Yeah. Tell me about that. What that must have been a lot of fun. Well, I had done story uh, tale theater for Shelley Duval. And it had been the giant in Jack and the Beanstalk. And, and the, that giant, uh, his wife, was played by Gene Stapleton. It was, very, it was a very good show. And then they had uh, a tall tales and legends, and they uh, asked me to be Casey at Casey at the Bat. And in that story, uh, Casey had to strike out because all of the industrialists and businessmen were betting on Casey, and if Casey had not struck out, we would have lost uh, the entire uh, uh, real estate of where the stadium was. There's a whole different generation which has grown up since you began in Star and Movies. Because I remember in the 70s, you made almost 30 films in 10 years. I don't, you, and then you appeared in The Bridge Too Far with Michael Caine and Gene Hackman, who were right up there with you making movies. What about Robert Redford? What's that? What about Robert Redford? Making movies like at that pace. Oh, at that pace. Yeah, yeah, what kids are doing it now, okay. kids have been doing it for some time. Yeah. Now, now two things I think were pivotal later on in your career. Uh, Ray Donovan and the uh, Oceans movies. And today in the, in the restaurant, the young woman said, oh yeah, I love them in the Oceans movies. That what about Friends? That's an earlier Friends. Yeah. $20, maybe it was 25 or 30. <laughs> well, well, maybe they gave you a tallest bear uh, also as a gift. Tom has a friend of mine, I can't, I can't show him for money. Uh, what do people stop you on the street? Well, in LA, nobody stops you on the street. You're always in your car. But in New York, when people recognize you, does it depend on their age? And they say, oh, I love you in this and that? Yes. What's the most uh, unlikely thing that they ever recognize you for? I have some ideas, but. Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, you want to be uh, humorous. No, I don't want to be honest. No, I'm just asking. But, uh, no, no, and I'm no, 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 still, no, I'm still looking for that uh, writer's name, which is right there. Uh, Paul Gallico, thank you. Yeah, he was a sports writer too. Paul Gallico wrote Matilda. And Robert Mitchum was in the picture with me. Most she difficult was. interview I have ever had. Bob Mitchum? Oh, he thought the red light and stopped talking. Oh my God. The moment the camera went off, he said, You know, your dad and I in the 40s. The moment the light went on, I got yes, no answer. Impossible. He and Robert De Niro seemed like an easy person to interview. I, and De Niro's an awesome. I loved Robert Mitchum, and Robert Mitchum told me that when he talked at Yale, there was one kid, one young student in the crowd who he knew uh, was uh, exceptional, and that turned out to be Dick Cavett. I thought you were going to say Ted Cruz, sorry. Uh, Are you okay? Yeah. Do you want to drink? Do you have something? Alan Dershowitz said that Ted Cruz, was the most, despite their differences politically, he's the most brilliant student he ever had. Uh, Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice also <coughs> was a huge hit, not only financially, but socially. I mean, it just broke so many barriers. When you, it came along at exactly the right time. Today it might be tame, but back then it was so audacious and daring and when you were making it, did you have any idea of the reaction? Well, um... Still thinking about my twenty dollars? No, no, I'm just thinking. I, I, I told you, in terms of being honest, I, um... I, I didn't know. It was uh, really interesting, because I think we had talked it, uh, when we were not here on camera, uh, that, um, 
of Mike Frankovich, who was running the studio. And, and, and by, at that time, he had caught the longest touchdown pass in, uh, for UCLA over the period of time, and he was married to Vicki Barnes. So Natalie Wood, Robert Culp, especially Natalie Wood, Diane Cannon, and me with the amazing Paul Mazursky's first uh, directorial assignment, and his partner and collaborator, Larry Tucker. Um, I didn't know about Manch. I, I didn't know. We had a, 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 a sneak preview in San Francisco where Fox sneaked MASH along with Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and I didn't really get MASH. I, 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 you know, but through the years, and when I come to see it, including tonight, or uh, I, I see something that I've never seen before, and Robert Altman does that. It's so full of life. At least you're not doing what Bob Hope did when he would see his really old movies. That I see his son there, I never knew I had. That's sweet. You mentioned you mentioned uh, uh, Paul Mazursky, who's also an actor. When you have a director who had been an actor, Sidney Lumet, for example, was a child actor. Is that a, something that is a, a joy for an actor? Can they do things and go about the task of directing you in a way that a, a director who has never acted? Well, I've never directed. So I, I wouldn't know. No, no, working with a director who had been an actor as well, like Mike Mazursky. Most directors haven't acted before, but there are some good Paul was, was uh, great with me. I remember there was one scene, and I, I, that was a very important picture to me because uh, I discovered my first objective relationship with the camera in that. And, and uh, me being as uh, uh, insecure as I was, uh, or could be, I remember saying to Paul, can I just sort of act like the way I feel? Can I be awkward? <laughs> you know, when, when, when uh, um, the character of Bob says, look at the camera, and, and uh, I'm self-conscious, and so my character came with self-conscious, I said, can I just go away? People would understand that, and Paul said, yeah. So Paul was extremely instrumental, and we thought we did, might do more pictures. He's such a sweet man. Because he, he had wanted me to do Alice in Wonderland, and then he started writing Bloom and Love for me, but uh, oh, I didn't get a chance to work with him again. Uh, well, you also uh, have finished a TV movie called Doubt with Catherine Heigl, right? No, that's not a TV movie. That's oh, okay. a, that we're talking now, we're right up into right. the moment. Right. You've got several projects coming. Yeah. When, when, when are we going to see that? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know. They, just, they picked up options, so it's still uh, on the back burner for CBS. Catherine Heigl is an hour show. I'm a, a criminal lawyer, and I'll be glad to represent you. <laughs> I love the names of some of your characters. Uh, Ezra Goldman, uh, Dr. Ian Sussman. Uh, you see a pattern here. That, that you Howard Scheinman was ER. Yeah, that's when we introduced George Clooney. Right. Yeah. Uh, also, did Rich Horn direct you in the telephone? Yeah. What was that like? Well, oh, that was not easy. Uh, oh, what well, was the Rich Horn directing? But that, that was uh, created. That was for Whoopi Goldberg, and Whoopi had come to a uh, a rehabilitation center that I was doing some work for for Chabad, and uh, and Whoopi came and did some work for us there. And then she asked me if I play her agent in the telephone, the telephone, the telephone. And Rip uh, directed it. And he said to me, I'm going to exploit as much time as I can with you and just push you to do so many things. But you don't have to push me. All you have to do is talk with me. I, he, he brought his, his twenty dollars. He brought his. <laughs> he brought his guitar playing singing niece around to the Tonight Show to audition to get her on the show. And they, they sent her back, back to quit the Texas, Texas Sissy Spacek. Uh, uh, you, this morning, uh, the other day actually, you really didn't give credit to a movie that, that, I, that, I, that I like, and I don't know if you, maybe I misinterpreted you. The other day, by way of introduction to this movie, I watched Ray Milland in, in uh, Lost Weekend, the first movie that really dealt with alcoholism straight on. You have made the only mixture that I know of about agoraphobia, Inside Out, made by my college teammate, directed the first time director, a guy named Mark Taylor, about a guy who was afraid to go out in the world. Tell me, that was a, must have been an odd experience to play a guy like that. Sure. 
In Capricorn 1, they faked the moon landing, hoping just this one time to get money. It was Mars. After you finish, can I tear this up? Mars. Uh, it was a Mars. I haven't seen it since I reviewed it. And, and, that, and that is pretty good. It is pretty good. Yes, yes. yes. Good cast. Yes. And, and, and uh, that character saves James Brolin. There's <laughs> more ways than one. There's <laughs> irony to that, too, which we'll get into. Tell me about being in, in that picture. I mean, did you know that the conspiracy theorists would jump on it and say, see, I told you they made a movie about this? I didn't know anything. I just it was a good job, and Peter wanted me to do it. I had done a picture for him uh, called Busting, where I played a vice cop, and uh, we cast Robert Blake to play my partner. And so in the two pictures I did with uh, Peter Himes, in the first one, there was Robert Blake, and in Calif uh, no, in uh, Capricorn One, there's O.J. Simpson. Yeah. Wow. You also worked, when I was a, when I was a, a sophomore in college, in Penn, my dad asked me to take the, a girl out because she was the daughter of friends of theirs from California. I said, Dad, I hate blind dates, please. And, and she doesn't want to have a blind date. Finally, I said, OK, her name was Candace Bergen. And, and she never tells that story about me. And I, whenever she's on Broadway, I bring, I go backstage and bring my wife and show my wife off to her. You made a picture with Candy. Okay, it was great. Yeah, yeah Candy. What are your memories of that? It was great. Richard Rush uh, uh, cast me. That was Columbia. We had breakfast, and, and Dick Rush said to me, "Can you be angry? Do you think you can be angry?" And I said, "Yeah." Also, that uh, Ingmar Bergman studied my work prior to his choosing me to play his part. In, uh, in, uh, as the first American in any of his productions. And uh, he, he, there was a scene in Getting Straight that he, he said I showed great restraint in. Candace was, uh, was just wonderful. Yeah. My, My last question, question before we throw it open, open I, promise. I promise. You, you worked with Sid Caesar in Over the Brooklyn Bridge. Now, Sid Caesar had his ups and downs in his own life, but he was a comedic genius. Was he the way you thought he would be? I watched the show of shows as a kid. And you had talked to me about Howie Morris and, and the whole group of people in the Gene Coca. Uh, Sid Caesar, actually, they let me suggest Sid to play my uh, patriarch. And we had a great scene in it. The picture I thought was going to be called My Darling Shiksa. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, of course, and uh, I'd love to call my wife, but, that's but uh, Sid was just great in it, and uh, he, it was fabulous for me to really get to know Sid and to work with him. We're going to throw it open for questions now, but before we do, Elliot mentioned Howard Marsh. Remember Howard Marsh from the Sid Teacher Show? When his, when his father died, his father loved the Hudson River, so they took his ashes in a, in a chocolate nuts coffee can. And Howard Morris was dressed in a white suit, Mel Brooks and, and, and Carl Ryan, and went down to the banks of the Hudson River. And as he opened the coffee, uh, coffee can, a gust of wind blew the ashes all over his suit. So he's gone like this. So he's, to this day, he says, my father's ashes are, some of them are in the river, and some of them wound up in Newman's cleaner. So. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have a question. I'll come to you with the microphone. I'd like to fire the first one. Talk about your friendship. You guys go back to our your friendship. Well, well my, my brother Warren, my late brother Warren, was an off-Broadway producer, produced the House of the Leagues, the original one with Ann Mira. And I knew Elliot through my brother Warren. So it's one of the treasured friendships that I have inherited now, my late brother Warren. So that's how my brother was an OB award winning. So the family, yeah. uh, Leonard, was always so kind to uh, my family, which uh, includes uh, my son's mother. tonight more closely than I did before. It, it's wonderful, you know. Uh, how did he feel? It's so uh, amazing. His son made more money on MASH uh, than Bob did. You know. They're a little dark. What? They're a little dark. What? Oh. Besides MASH at the time, yeah. Well, well, that wasn't a very good song. song. Yeah. A lot of stuff comes through my mind. They were a little dark. 
Wow. We can talk about that sometime. I mean, I'm dark. Um, what's that? <laughs> 20 bucks? You're okay? Were you at the press conference yesterday? On the journalists that I, that I, I met yesterday? No? Oh, all right. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm a little dark at this point. Wow. MASH is known as one of the funniest, most popular television shows and movies ever. A little dark, Bob Hoffman. Uh, I can't tell you how Bob felt. Uh, I would, uh, but he Bob felt great. Hi, hi. I, was, I want to give you a card. Actually, would you hand this to both of them? I made one for both of you. And it's got every movie you've been in, and it says, uh, with love from the donors. Oh, great. Thank you. I spotted one here. I spotted one here, and I had to bring to the mind a quick story. It's not the punchline. I was walking my four-year-old son through the park, and suddenly Miss Piggy comes by on roller skates. They were filming the Muppets Take Manhattan, one of his films. Wow! Look at that. Oh, you did that. Oh, thank you. Pocoon was the first book that Spike Milligan wrote, and Spike Milligan was one of the Goonies. Uh, along Harry Seacombe and Peter Siller, Sellers, who was a friend of mine. And I was able, to, in, in that picture, to play Dr. Goldstein, which was my father's name and on my birth certificate. I'm Goldstein. Uh, and, and Richard Attenborough is acting in that picture as well. I, I got to do a one hour radio interview with Peter Sellers, and I was told, don't wear green, don't face southwest, watch out for the, because of all these crazy superstitions. How am I going to open up? So I brought along my, one of my closest friends, who's one of the few Americans who could do the goon shows right from memory. And they started speaking their own language, and I got a great hour with him. I'll never forget that. He just died too young. He was, he was a genius. Do we have any? Any? Hey, 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 yeah. I have a question. Well, first of all, I want to say I haven't seen this movie since. Oh, that's dangerous. It is. Since 1968. And it is as wonderful, if not more wonderful than it was then. And I want to thank you so much for your performance, because it is superb. Oh, I have a question. I have a question. I have a question. You made one more movie with Donald Sutherland. Two. What, two, two more. Two more. Two more. Do you know the murders? No, I don't. Oh, he's crazy. The priest in it. Donald? Yes. I, I remember everything. I told you in the beginning. Uh, and I remember when I went down to visit him when he was doing a picture in on Paradise Island uh, with Jennifer O'Neill. I don't remember the name of the picture. And Kiefer was with him. And Kiefer uh, and Kiefer's twin sister, Rachel, uh, they are born within a week of my son Jason. And, and, and Donald and I uh, uh, love one another. And, and so Kiefer didn't want me to leave. He said, please stay. I'll give you uh, uh, ice cream, a, a vanilla cone. And I, I said, uh, I, uh, I have to go kiss me. And he took the cone and he put it on my cheek. <laughs> you told us last night how awestruck you were when you met Beatrice's father. Oh, well, I'm awestruck uh, with the Beatrice being a uh, Beatrice. Of course. Uh, Beatrice was. Of course. You know, and, and oh, the, 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 I mean, Orson Welles, my goodness gracious, there, there only was one. And uh, I have a friend that actually happens to be the son of uh, Henry of Jacqueline, who is uh, uh, middle name, he's named after Orson. Yeah, yeah. There are so many wonderful elements in this movie, well, it doesn't know where to begin, but I wanted to ask you about the end, and that's it, that is the credits. I love the way the credits were done in this movie, and it's, uh, it's in MASH, I'm talking about. I know you are, I know you are. It's just and, the worst. And I'm just wondering why it is that in so many movies these days that we see, the credits go by so quickly, and I'm talking about the cast now, I'm not talking about who catered it, I'm talking about the cast. And all of them are so audacious. 
that everybody had to turn down Nash on, on both sides of the camera. And, and of course, then it must have been an, an absolute insult uh, to Bob when Donald and I complained. But, you know, I, I admit uh, that we were, uh, you know, not quite there. Uh, and it all worked out. But the mesh really, really works. It's, uh, and Donald is fabulous in it. And Tom Skerritt is brilliant in it. Everyone in it, you know, it's such a great ensemble. And then Bob also, then he had asked me I was representing and doing some PR for Spies, which was the last picture that we did uh, together up to now. As I say, I, I don't quit. Uh, and, uh, and I was in Atlanta, and Bob was in Nashville. He said, come down, you know. And, and, and he said, be in the picture. And, and I'm, I'm Elliot Gould uh, in Nashville, you know. Um, about war in the last decade or so. You know, to see another Robert Altman, although uh, Anderson, I mean, there are people who followed Bob. You know, what's his name? Wes Anderson. Not Wes. The one who did, uh, not Wes Anderson. He's Paul Anderson. Paul Anderson. Another one. Another one. No, for me, it's Paul Anderson. You know, I mean, Paul Anderson is stunning. For me, Robert Altman's work uh, uh, reflects life taking its course, which is what it's about. I mean, there are great craftsmen, brilliant filmmakers and all of that, but then you, you, you have, we have the privilege and opportunity to work with great craftsmen. Bob Altman was just amazing. I remember he told me he flew like 50 missions in World War II. B-29, he said, so no matter what, the studio or the executives or the corporate mind does what can they do to him. He flew 50 missions in combat over Nazi Germany, you know. No, Robert Altman to me was the American director, and there were great, I, I just recommended uh, The Quiet Man, you know, by, by John Ford. And I mean, there are great directors, great, great, great directors. One or two more, yeah. One, oh, great. And then we, you know, you're going to have to identify everybody here. <laughs> with the, with, with the 20 hours. Hours. Um, Not to disparage Alan Alda, but with such a great cast. Okay, this, this film was not made with a, this kind of thing. So not to disparage Alan Alda, with such a great cast from the original movie. How come there weren't more of the original actors from the film on the TV show? You can't disparage Alan Alda. He was perfect. Uh, uh, I, I'm not a politician. I'm not a businessman. But I recognize uh, uh, it. And so I believe that the television series of MASH was very good for the original film of MASH. There wouldn't have been a television series. We didn't have a laugh track. I mean, I, 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 I say I see something each time that I hadn't seen before. So you see with this, the picture that Bob did before this was A Cold Day in the Park, which was a comedy with Sandy Dennis. And he had done Countdown, which Jimmy Conn and Bobby Doha do now. That was a comedy. And he had done a, a, a picture about, uh, maybe it was a documentary, about Jimmy Dean and a lot of television stuff. This was a groundbreaking film, and it works. And all of Bob's work can work, it should work. I watched, he would have me come into the office and I saw Quintet, well, I think, which was the first film that he did with uh, Paul Newman and Victoria Gossman. Oh my God, I thought it was, gonna, it was really hard, except at the very end, where the character of Newman is walking further in north where there's no civilization. Than, than you would imagine, and there's a bird. And I said, you know, you always have something for me. There's life, I've got to stick with it. 
wherever there's a possibility for life, I'll stick with it. But not to disparage. I mean, I think I think Gary Burkhoff was the only one who, who yeah, he was adorable in this. He was just great. Who's that? No, Hobbes different Hobbes. But it wasn't Sally. No, it wasn't Sally. Loretta Smith. Loretta Smith. Loretta Smith. Loretta Smith. Loretta Smith. Yeah. 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 What would you tell these new actors how they should proceed with their careers? Actors or filmmakers? Oh, don't give up. Are you kidding? I mean, keep reading. I mean, I know to act. I mean, I, 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 I didn't do the uh, seminar yesterday or the discussion about film acting, but the key to me is just to listen. You, you know, just stay interested. That was the last thing that John Houston, who was a friend of mine, said to us, stay interested, you know? Well, before you go, Mr. Gould, we have a little presentation to make to you, and I'm glad you're all here. And don't say hello to you on the red carpet on the way out as well. But we would like to present to you our Lifetime Achievement Award. That's very nice. I'm gonna read it to you. In honor of your passion and dedication to acting and your commitment to the art of independent filmmaking, in recognition of your outstanding career of bringing memorable characters to life on screen and in our hearts, and an appreciation of your devotion to making films that make a difference. Thank you for sharing your passion with us and with the world. Mr. Elliot Gould, and the next time you. And thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Elliot Gould. Thank you, Dr. Lyons. Feel free to be our guest. You don't need a ticket. Benjamin Troubles is showing you here. Proceeded by escape. You can even stay in the theater. It's okay. Man. Just do a sound check. But if you have nowhere else to go, please sit around and be our guest here.